Joseph, you've written some books about Shakespeare and you've edited some studies of Shakespeare. What, let's get a list of what are the main works you've done regarding with Shakespeare. Well, the, the two books published with Ignatius Press are uh, The Quest for Shakespeare, uh, The Bard of Avon and the Church of Rome, uh, and also Through Shakespeare's Eyes, Seeing the Catholic Presence in the Plays. I've also written a third book on Shakespeare, which Ignatius will be publishing, so I understand, oh. uh, called Shakespeare on Love, Seeing the Catholic Presence in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and you can edit that out, by the way, if you decide not to publish it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'll just disappear. <laughs> and I also have edited for the Ignatius Critical Editions, uh, uh, editions of King Lear, Hamlet, uh, Julius Caesar, Romeo and Juliet. Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth. Oh, yes. Yes, and, and, and others in the works as well. All right, and for those critical editions, you had other scholars contribute. Yeah, I edited the editions, I wrote the introductions, but the um, but there were critical uh, essays by Shakespeare scholars from uh, from across the academy, uh, you know, around the world, not just in the United States, but, but Germany and England. Now you, opposing the whole mainstream and all Shakespeare scholarship, contend that he was actually a Roman Catholic. <laughs> well, certainly the mainstream is always worth opposing, because it's normally wrong, Father. I um, I and not just in Shakespeare, but in, but in many other things, as, as, as you know. But certainly what, what I would say is that, that my position on Shakespeare as Shakespeare and being a Catholic is not idiosyncratic in the sense that I am alone eccentric. There's uh, been... Uh, There's other eccentrics. There are 150 years of eccentrics in the same tradition. Um, <laughs> and by eccentric, of course, we really mean that they're, they're not in the centre, they're not in the mainstream, so that's fine. Um, but you know, going back to Richard Simpson, Victorian times, and people such as Newman, who, who, who asserted that we, you know, that we can, without extravagance, claim Shakespeare as a Catholic, Chesterton, um, so these great, as well as sort of, you know, if you like, scholars who trawled through for documentation. Mm -hmm. And I would like to make it perfectly clear here that the argument in the first book uh, for... for, uh, for uh, well, there's, no, there's no evidence, right? <laughs> well, of course there's no evidence, but with enough rhetoric and smoke screens, you can <laughs> prove anything further. Now, now in, in, in the quest for Shakespeare, I mean, the whole point about the quest for Shakespeare, the first book, is it's, it's looking well, at... By the way, oh, uh, we there, have it right here. There. Um, the question of Shakespeare. Shakespeare, the Bard of Avon. Happens and to be on our bookshelf. Uh, well, some yeah. coincidence. Yeah, and you, 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 you read it all the time, don't you, yeah. Father? Yes. <laughs> sir. Um, but the evidence in that book is purely documentary from Shakespeare's life, from the life of his family, from Shakespeare's own life, from the people he knew, the people that were his friends, the people that were his enemies, property de deeds, uh, wills and testaments. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pure. Uh, factual evidence. You know, that's it's, it's not uh, uh, speculative, and there's some of the factual evidence uh, raises speculation. And I hope in my book, you know, I, I've, I've differentiated between that, which is so solid that uh, you know nobody sensibly can query it or question it, to, those, to that which is okay. You've got you've got you know one plus one equals two, but therefore is the, are there other things? And then it gets more speculative. Mm -hmm. But I think that I make I make I make it clear when, when I'm being more speculative. But the evidence. Oh, Overall, is that Shakespeare was a believing Catholic, brought up as a believing Catholic, remains a believing Catholic, including during the 15 or so years that he's writing his plays, uh, and dies as a believing Catholic. And that's the evidence in the first book. In the second book, I look at the plays to see how that Catholicism plays itself out, if you like, in the plays themselves. Well, I think I read he, he played bingo on Monday nights, so probably that, that's the key evidence. Well, yeah, the, because all Catholics play bingo yeah. on Monday nights, Father, yeah, right. But Except those in Naples, Florida that played golf, but that's another matter. Uh, but he was living in a time when the Catholic Church was persecuted. So to be a Catholic meant a life that was endangered, really. So what was it like for him? I mean, how did it, was did he make compromises to be, to be able to do his plays or, or what? Right. Well, there's a few things we need to realize here. I mean, we, have to, we have to dispel uh, various myths because, yes, it was a time when... Catholicism was very bad, badly persecuted. I mean, between the 1530s... It was very well persecuted. It was very badly persecuted, yes. Uh, well, they did a good job of it. They, they, they were very well persecuted. <laughs> <laughs> 1530s and 1680s, a period of 150 years, you know, uh, Catholics were put to death for their faith. And we have 40 canonized martyrs, 100, uh, 100 and, uh, I'll get this right now, 85 beatified martyrs. Um, and many others, of course, have not been officially mm -hmm. recognized by the church that were killed for their faith. Um, but the, we have to, in Shakespeare's time, a very large portion of the English population were still Catholic. Um, at least in sensibility and sympathy, uh, and in many cases in, 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 in practice, secret. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike in Europe, 
the English Reformation was not uh, a question of belief. It was forced upon the people by the king and his ministers. So it was resented from the beginning. Mm. So in Shakespeare's time, uh, certainly when Shakespeare was beginning to write, the majority of the English people were still sympathetic towards Catholicism. By the time he finished writing, the tide was definitely turning against Catholicism for various historical reasons. So Shakespeare's writing in this cauldron of change um, as a believing Catholic. Uh, we need to remember that people such as uh, Thomas Tallis was a known Catholic who was fine for his Catholicism, was also uh, in the Queen's pay uh, as the court composer. Uh, of the Chapel Royal. So, you know, Catholics were known, who were known to be Catholics were tolerated if they were not perceived to be a threat to the Queen's life. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to think, well, Shakespeare's Catholicism was not known. In fact, one of the arguments I make in my book is a chapter called Playing Safe with the Queen, is that his Catholicism was known, but that he was not perceived to be a threat uh, to mm -hmm. the Queen. Of course, his faith is irrelevant to his work. I mean, the text is there, right? I mean, we've got his works. It doesn't matter whether he's a Catholic or not. Well, it doesn't matter if he's a Catholic or not if we believe that a work of literature uh, is not um, a product of the personality of the person writing it. And, of course, if it is a product of the personality of the person writing it, then what, what is the most important ingredient in that person's personality? What are the most important beliefs? What are, those, the, what are the beliefs that frame their outlook of life more than any, any other? It's going to be their theology and their philosophy, so their religion and their, and, and their, their philosophical outlook. So if Shakespeare's a Catholic, he's going to write as a Catholic, not just, you know, Catholicism is not something you put to one side, you know, uh, and take out on a Sunday morning. It's something which informs your life and, and all of your beliefs. So if you, if you are a Catholic, you're going to write as a Catholic. Even if, you do, even if, even if it's subliminal, you're going to be writing as a Catholic. So you don't think a Buddhist could have written Hamlet? A Buddhist could certainly not have written Hamlet, and, uh, and nor could most modern Shakespeare critics. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, let's see, well, what do you have planned uh, for future Shakespeare works? Well, um, as I say, I, I've written a third book, uh, Shakespeare on Love, on the Catholic presence in Romeo and Juliet. We have uh, many more, I mean, God willing, we'll cover all of the plays in the Ignatius Critical Editions over the years, but certainly mm. so about one in every four or five of the Ignatius Critical Editions is a Shakespeare play. So we've already got six, and, the, and that, that will be increasing. What about the sonnet? Should we, should we do the sonnet? I would, I would actually do Shakespeare's poetry, is something else I'd like to do, sonnets, mm. and then the, 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 the three, three or so longer poems that he wrote would be a, a, something I would love to do. Now in this other book, uh, Through Shakespeare's Eyes, look at those eyes, uh, you took only three plays, like Merchant of Venice, uh, Macbeth, no, and Merchant of Venice, Hamlet, and uh, King Lear. And King Lear, okay. Were those just because you happen to know something about those plays, or was there some <laughs> reason why you chose those three? Well, I, in fact, I knew something about them. Was an, it, was, it was certainly a, a factor in my decision. I see. Um, but, but no, what, what became clear to me uh, is that in order to prove the Catholicism in the plays, what, what some scholars have done um, is to pluck individual lines from the plays uh, and say, look, this is an evidence of Catholicism, that's an evidence for Catholicism. Well, you know, a counter-critic could just say, well, yeah, that's what that, that line from Act 1 says that, but you know, what about this, uh, this line from Act 4 seems to contradict that and mm -hmm. that could be said to be atheistic. So plucking lines out of context doesn't prove anything. So I thought it was necessary to actually look at plays in detail and go through them scene by scene right. to show the whole work. So it was necessary to just concentrate on a few plays and, uh, and go, go into them in depth and to just look at uh, the whole thing panoramically. But any reason why those three plays as opposed to not three other plays? Or Well, I mean, certainly the three of the best known plays uh, and they're, three, they're considered to be three of his greatest plays and in their own way, all three of them uh, manifest Shakespeare's Catholicism uh, in a very powerful way. Uh, in uh, The Merchant of Venice, for instance, the Jesuit presence uh, is palpable. Um, it's... Uh, believed by many uh, scholars, including myself, that and the, the... Were they Catholics then? The Jesuits. Je Jesuits in those days were Catholics, rather, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, one or two still are, apparently, so I understand. Um, we may have to cut this. <laughs> 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 um, but, 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 you know, but that the characterization of uh, Shylock and the Merchant of Venice, so uh. he, he's, he's Jewish, but there were no Jews in England at the time. Um, so there was no anti-Semitism in the sense you would understand it. Um, uh, but the Puritans were the ones that were um, practicing usury. And it seemed that Shylock was a, de it was a depiction of, uh, of, of, of the Puritan. And interwoven in the, in the whole of that 
play is uh, an engagement with the poetry of St. Robert Southall, the Jesuit martyr, uh, uh, who actually was, 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 was martyred uh, in about the same time, literally, that Shakespeare's writing the play, 1595. So uh, you can show by this intertextual relationship between you know, uh, what's being said by Shakespeare is obviously, uh, should we say, a dialectic uh, and a dialogue with uh, the poetry of uh, Sir Robert Southall. Well, it's obviously, for anyone who's tried, it's difficult to read Shakespeare. I mean, the language isn't the same as our language today. One reason we have the critical editions is precisely to give notes and commentary so to help modern readers understand the play. But what advice would you give someone who doesn't know much about Shakespeare and just wants to begin reading Shakespeare. I mean, how, how would you tell them to read Shakespeare? Well, I think the, 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 the most important thing Besides is... Besides buying our editions, but... Well, I, mean. I was going to begin with that. And I, actually, not even just jokingly, I do believe that Ignatius Critical Editions uh, frame Shakespeare in a way that makes them easily accessible. So if you, for instance, buy the, the Ignatius Critical Edition of Hamlet, Hamlet's one of the most difficult of Shakespeare's plays. But the introduction uh, in the book and then the critical essays in the back and the, and the, the annotation of the play itself, the footnotes... Um, will be an anybody can approach the play r through the Ignatius Critical Edition and understand it. Now Shakespeare's English, of course, takes a little bit of effort. Well, so you does know. yours. <laughs> but listen, I, I make it. Listen, Father, it. Listen, father I, I live in a culture where I'm aware all the time I'm the only one that doesn't have an accent. So don't <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, we're going to have, uh, you know, what do they call those things at the bottom of the, of the screen? Uh, subtitles? Subtitles. Is that, is that for you or for me? We, we <laughs> <laughs> well, in England, it'll be for me. But. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> would you replay that, please? And, uh, <laughs> well, I know, how would you read Shakespeare? You talk about the Christian Well, yeah, I mean, the point is that, that Shakespeare's English is not that difficult, but just requires a little bit of effort in the first instance. Um, and the, the problem, of course, in modern education is it's dumbed down so much that people are looking for the path of least resistance at all times. So find something modern in the modern vernacular that the kids will relate to, which, of mm. course, is completely irrelevant, not only now, but will be even more so five years from now. So they're learning nothing. Whereas what's being uh, 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 shown in Shakespeare uh, is timeless truth in, in about the most beautiful English you're ever going to find. So, of course, in reading Shakespeare, not only are you getting a, a perennial philosophy and a perennial theology, you're actually getting a sublime English. And you really only, you only speak and you only write as well as you read. So if you read Shakespeare, you'll be writing better, you'll be speaking better, your, your, your vocabulary will broaden. Um, so uh, for the little bit of effort involved in just, shall we say, moving up a gear in order to be able to read Shakespeare comfortably, it's a small price to pay. So, read the Bard. <laughs> thank you, Joseph. My pleasure, thank you.